how does wide open school sit on top of the curriculum my child is getting, you know, in the classroom? That's the exact it, look at it. So hopefully your kids are, are getting, and hopefully the folks out there in the audience's kids are getting some degree of classroom instruction via mm -hmm. the internet over a Zoom connection, over a Google Hangout connection, whatever. But wide open school sits on top of that because we're at this point, we're not trying to replace what your kid's school can give you for fourth grade math or sixth grade reading or whatever, how, whatever age your kid is. Yeah. Um, but, we are, so, but we're providing you all sorts of incredible stuff from Khan Academy or Scholastic or National Geographic, Smithsonian, you name it. However, in some cases, some of the school districts in the United States right now have nothing, zero. Right. So, it, and we create at wideopenschool.org, which is basically common sense media education, our education program on steroids. We give you a daily schedule. Everything from here's how you could learn geography or history or math or whatever mm -hmm. to fun live events. Like we're doing a live webinar right now, but you're gonna see increasing amount of live programming. We did a thing last week with Sal Khan and Bill Gates talking about science and climate change. Wow. From and we're gonna have lots of people like Bill Gates on. You would never think that he could teach a science class, but he's, he's a pretty smart guy. <laughs> and, he's, what? and maybe we'll have you, Jonathan, teaching history or something. I'm, I love sorry. that. And we've gotten celebrities and we've gotten athletes to do gym class because one of the other things we wanna be telling our kids right now is to get out there and also exercise. You really, if you're a parent right now in the audience, you, I know your kid is taking their classes online, but they still have to have normal meal time, family yeah. meal. They have to do exercise. You want to get them up and out. If you can, I don't know the specifics of everybody's situation, but you want to have a normal, healthy day, even though we're all cooped up inside in this sheltering at home exercise, which we should all be following, by the way, because it's in our own and everybody else's health. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to give you a daily schedule and then all sorts of different educational offerings. So even if your school is not even functioning right now, and the sad truth is there are literally thousands of schools around the US that are not functioning at all right now, we can give you a daily menu of educational and edutainment content that can keep your kid informed and inspired. And that's the point of wideopenschool.org in common sense. I love it, I love it. So let me ask you, like, how do you think this digital learning will change the long term positively, or this crisis will change the short and the long term? Do you think there'll be kind of policy changes as a result of this crisis? Do you think there'll be more like tactical changes in the way the actual everyday school operates? What's your, what's your thought on that? I just would say this, Jonathan, things are not gonna be the same when we, we're gonna come out of this as a country and, we're, and, as, a, and as a global society. But things are gonna be different, no question. I would say the two areas that are gonna be fundamentally transformed mm -hmm. are education and medicine. I think medicine and healthcare will never be the same after this crisis, not just because of the vaccine that will ultimately develop or some of the implications of a, of a pandemic like this, but because we're gonna realize that we can deliver a lot of information this way. Mm -hmm. So we, it's funny, when, you know, Jonathan, I remember talking to you a month ago when we were first getting the idea for wide open school. And you and I work together on the Stop Hate campaign because we right. totally support what the ADL does as the leader in the country on those issues. But it's clear to me now that it's not gonna be the same when we get through this. That yeah. many teachers, many more students are gonna be using platforms like this to supplement their day-to-day -day classroom activities, mm -hmm. maybe to teach, you know, I'll tell you this, I'm a Stanford professor, I don't even know if we're going to have classes in the fall. We don't have classes right now. My, right. I, one of my kids is in another room in the house doing her spring quarter senior year online at Stanford. I can assure you she'd rather be on campus. And right. going to, but I don't even know if I'm going to teach my big Stanford class in the fall in person or online. And I think that what's going to happen is we're going to realize the potential of this medium, comma, if used wisely, comma, for the future of education. I think the same thing is gonna happen in medicine and healthcare as well. Well, so that's an interesting question. So as a parent, whether you've got college kids or high school kids yeah. or younger, what do you think is critical for, for us to be thinking about? Like, what would be your advice 
to the moms and dads who are watching as we think about, again, our kids kind of learning discipline? I would say learn with them. It's a great question. Learn with them. You know, the funny thing is we're all cooped up inside right now with our families. Yeah. I've been talking to friends who are like, we haven't had this many family dinners in a year. We've had <laughs> dinners in the last couple of weeks than we had in the last two years. Right. So there's a lot of good things. By the way, it also can bring out all the issues that you have in your family, too. You know oh, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm the father of four kids, and they may be perfect, but they aren't. And no <laughs> one so right. really it's really been fun. But I think that there's that's a chance to learn together. You know, in many ways, my kids are way more digitally digitally literate than I am. I they fix our computers. If we have problems with anything related to computers, it's our kids who fix it, not me and my wife. So yeah. I think the really interesting thing is you should learn with your kids and participate with them. You can also do family movie nights every week or three times a week. You can play games with them, board games, by the way. You don't have to just play Jeopardy online. Right. You can, how about Monopoly and Risk and all the things that you and I grew up with, Jonathan? Yeah, are, yeah. absolutely right. So that leads me to actually- What happens is, what happens? Go, Jim. No, go ahead. there's just so many opportunities, I think, to, for parents to learn with their kids. That's the key, learn with your children. I agree. I agree. So I want to ask one last question before I move on. So how do you think about learning this kind of digital decorum online? Because we're very concerned about online harassment. There's been a lot of talk about Zoom bombing in recent weeks. We see other kind of call outs in online gaming environments. We know about cyber stalking. So how do you deal with that in the context of wide open schools or is that an opportunity? I think it is an opportunity. Look, we've been doing the digital literacy stuff for about 10 years now, and we're incredibly proud of it. And we created a curriculum that is in the vast majority of schools in the United States. And it includes things like harassment and cyberbullying and privacy, issues that are so important to each and every one of us, to you and me and our kids, Jonathan, but to everybody's kids and family. And we pioneered that field, and we literally have a curriculum in probably in about two-thirds of the schools in the United States. But this crisis is making those issues so much more important because what we now see, you're, you mentioned Zoom bombing. We see people interrupting Zoom conferences with large numbers of people with hateful messages, with racist messages, with anti-Semitic messages. So it's just bringing to the fore the fact that the medium of the internet, the digital reality that we all live with today can be subject to harassment, misinformation, bullying, hate-filled speech and content, et cetera. And so in some ways, I think by peeling off the Band-Aid and showing that to everybody, it's a chance for all of us to get together and say, we want the right kind of digital citizenship, the kind of healthy, thoughtful, respectful environment that we all deserve. Because it's so easy to do something by the click of a button as opposed yeah. to standing somebody in person. So there's a huge rise in misinformation and hate issues right now. We're seeing it even in some of the demonstrations across the country about reopening the country while people are still dying of COVID-19. Um, so it's a great opportunity for the ADL and for Common Sense to partner and educate the public. Well, I am, I am super, I, know I can just tell you I'm so excited for that. So I see we've got a lot of questions in the queue. Deb, maybe we can go to you to kind of field the questions and direct them at, at Jim or myself? Absolutely, so let us get started. Um, so the first question we have is, how do we get, how, how do we help get our elementary school teachers Zoom training? Is it really even possible to do any real teaching for first graders in this way? Hmm. You want me to, I'd be happy to answer that. Do it. Number, there's a portion, Deb, of the, of the wideopenschool.org website that's basically for teachers and it's sort of Zoom for dummies, <laughs> Google Hangout for <laughs> By the way, I'm a dummy, so I don't mind saying that to the other teachers out there. It's <laughs> not, and if you're a first grader, it's true, but you're, it's a really good question because think about a first grader. You're talking about a six or seven year old kid. How much yeah. attention span do they have? But so what we can do is you can do this kind of class, right? Remember you have 20 kids or 25 kids all on a Zoom or Google Hangout screen. But I think you can show them really interesting stuff from Sesame Street, or you can show them stuff from PBS Kids or from 
Khan Academy is mostly for middle and high school kids, but there is content. But it's, it's a great question because you know what you also have to do with those kids? Let them run around and exercise and do fun stuff. It's not that easy. And so we have all sorts of tips and tools about that. But we're just, we're in version 1.0 in Wide Open School. So we're open to suggestions from the audience. But I agree, like with preschool kids and sort of the K through second right now, it's tough if you're a first grade teacher to do it online. So you have to use breaks and exercise and juice snacks and all the things you do. It's hard being a first grade teacher in real life or in non-virtual life. Uh, but, but having said it, that's, we have to live with this right now. Period. Yeah, and uh, the, one of the other questions that's sort of populated and, and been asked in a couple of different ways is how do we encourage kids to grow socially during this? Like distance learning is one thing, but a whole part of the school experience is growing socially. Are, are there platforms? Does your platform do this? What can we do to help encourage that kind of growth? I think that's a great question too. I mean, the thing is, with younger kids, I don't want to get them used to the idea that the best way to interact with people is over the internet. I don't know if you agree with me, Jonathan, because I totally do. You, you've got kids. I don't want my kids to think, my kids are a little older, but I don't want them to think the right way to interact with people in general is over the internet or via text messaging or on Instagram or Snapchat which and YouTube. Those are the three most popular platforms for kids, guys. And so I don't want my kids to think that that's a substitute for being in person. So I think part of it now is as a parent, you're sort of in overdrive. You, you also need to have your own sanity and, and, and time off too. But I do think in this particular period, we have to use technology more for social interaction. But the one thing I don't want people to think is that in the long run, there's any substitute for personal, interpersonal interaction, looking people in the eye. The one good thing about, by the way, about FaceTime, or about Zoom is you can see the other person. I can see you and Jonathan right now. I, I always think that's better than the an anonymity of text messaging or flaming people. That's why I think so much bullying happens in cyberspace because you're not really responsible if you can't see the person. But it's a challenge because right now we're all stuck at home and we have to use this medium to communicate. What do you yeah. think, John? What do you think? No, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think that this is a is a poor substitute for the in-person face-to-face everyday kind of collisions and connections that happen in a classroom or a hallway or the lunchroom or or the or the the gym the library that being said in this environment it's helpful to realize the dimensionality that this does enable as jim said like we can see each other and in the seeing not just the hearing but the seeing i think it enables a different kind of connection than previously was possible the interactivity is something like the likes of which science fiction writers just dreamed about, and now we almost take it for granted. So this is this is not what school should be, right? But you know what? In the absence of being able to connect in person, uh, I think this is this is pretty good, and hopefully it will get better. I agree. The one thing I would say to people in the audience, because I've seen some of the questions popping up, about, you know, I'm not technologically savvy. I just want to tell you something. I may run the largest children's media and advocacy group in the world, but I am a dummy. I don't know anything about technology. My kids have to turn on my computer for me. So even if you're out there going, I'm not tech savvy, I don't know how to do this, you can turn on your computer, and if you can't, your kids can turn it on for you, or they can turn your phone on for you if you don't know how to do it. It's pretty simple. And one of the things that common sense and is, we try to make it really easy for you. We try to make it really simple, because because it was started by a dummy like me. And so we understand that we aren't that tech savvy. And by the way, that's true for teachers. I'm a teacher. Most right. teachers, no idea. We didn't expect that in March, you suddenly had to start teaching your class online. So we're trying to make it really simple and provide training and simple tips and tools. And hang in there, because help is on the way. That's my reaction to that. <laughs> I like that. I like the help is on the way part. It is though, it really is. And it is. that's trying to do with wide open school. We're trying to keep it really simple for people. Yeah, and I think that's really helpful. And I agree, you just kept seeing that pop up that I'm not tech savvy question. One of the other things that's consistently populating in the questions are questions about uh, closing the gap and income disparity and how those things affect education. 
and given the high percentage of students who lack sufficient digital access, what can we do in the short term, at, you know, like this crisis to address that? Well, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I think we're gonna close the digital divide. I'm not kidding. So we're here in California, I th which is a, the largest state in the United States, right? Fifth largest economy in the world. And we have a huge proportion of, we also have the highest, second highest poverty rate of any state in the world, of the United States. So you have this incredible wealth, you have the tech industry, you know, we have Google, Apple, Facebook, all of them out here, right? And by the way, all of them are helping on, on wide open school and on trying to do this now. We're gonna close the digital divide in California, I'd say in the next couple of weeks, because we went to the big companies, Google, Apple, AT&T, Verizon, and said, guys, you have the ability to provide devices to everybody. You can yep. provide activity and you know it, and, and you can also pay for the data plans. So if you're a low income family, who's, bare, who's just trying to survive right now, there are so many people out there who've lost their jobs, who've lost their income. By the way, our polling shows that the biggest concern kids have right now is for their parents and for their income and their ability to just have enough food on the table. But we're going to all the major tech companies in the United States and saying, step up right now. You need to provide the connectivity and the devices and then help us provide the content so that everybody has the same opportunity. And I actually mean that. I think we're gonna, this is one of the good things that I think may come out of this crisis. I think we will give every kid the opportunity to learn at home during this crisis. Because, and if we don't, shame on the country. It, everyone should have that opportunity. It's completely wrong if there's a poor kid in East LA or, or a poor part of New York City or Chattanooga, Tennessee, or some part of Maryland who doesn't have a device or internet access. We all, every kid, that's not fair to a child. Every yeah. child has an opportunity. And I think we're gonna be able to close the digital divide. We just need some political leadership mm -hmm. in Washington at the state level. And I actually think that's one of the good things that's gonna come out of this, this crisis. Here, here. Well said. Uh, so Jonathan, we received a question earlier you mentioned uh, dealing with issues of bias in your conversation. Uh, does mm -hmm. ADL have tools for that? Are they digital? Is this something that we can be doing with our kids today? Oh yeah, so ADL, <clears throat> we have extensive tools and I would say we're probably the leader in the country on anti-bias education. No question. The work of our education department is really uh, peerless. So in, in brief, you know, ADL reaches about a million and a half school kids every year. We're doing that through a plethora of content that's been offered inside classrooms. We have education resources that are now available online. For example, we have a product called Books Matter, which is our online bibliography of children's and young adult books about identity and bias and bullying. We do a book of the month club that includes discussion guides for teachers or parents. We have a product called Table Talk, which uh, is a collection of parent and family discussion guides about current events and the news of the day. It sort of has a ripped from the headlines feel so that you can make sense of COVID-19. You can make yeah. sense of the anti-Asian the anti racism that we're seeing manifest around COVID-19. We have lesson plans K through 12 that introduce current events topics through the lenses of diversity and bias and social justice. We have resources on bullying and cyberbullying. Um, it's all available at abl.org slash education. And Jonathan, we should tell, we've talked about partnering on that. The ADL resources are going to be up on Wide Open School. Right. And in the long run, we have, Common Sense has this massive distribution network of schools all across the United States. We right. have enormous respect for the anti-bias stuff that you guys are doing. And Jonathan and I both know we've been talking, we're going to partner on that and make that available to basically every school in the country. Because yep. the one thing about a crisis is there are major opportunities, Deb, but yep. there's also, it, brings, it can bring out the best in us and the worst in us and some of the worst stuff we see too. And so that's the hatred and the bias and the anti-Semitic and racist behavior. I'm glad you brought up the anti-Asian stuff, Jonathan. You know, all this blaming it on China garbage. What is this about? Come yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, I'm disgusting. And you know, Not we're tracking real incidents of hate. We're talking yeah. about violence, assault, harassment, Yep. Um, vandalism against Asian American people, the people who are perceived to be Chinese. And when elected officials, you know, repeat these ridiculous racist statements, it lets it flow even more. And it's, 
You know, there's nothing political and there's nothing partisan about pushing back on prejudice. Period, exactly. end of story. So well said, couldn't agree more. I think those are, those are excellent points all around. Uh, Along these lines, we've received multiple questions, and so this one is a little bit of a two-parter, probably both of you can answer, um, about how to keep our kids safe online, both in terms of privacy and information. We had one person who was sharing that their child shared their phone number, and it led to a whole series of incidents. How, are we how can we educate our kids about that? And then the second piece of this was about cyberbullying and what can we do to stop that? And are there resources available to help teachers and parents uh, deal with those things? I mean, go to commonsense.org, guys. We, all, we have a huge treasure trove of content about cyberbullying and about keeping your kids safe and responsible online. And, and so, I mean, literally, commonsense.org is, that's, that's what we're here for. This is sort of our moment, guys. Go look at it. <laughs> There's so, you just type it in and you will find so many simple, easy to use tips and tools. But you're right. It is a moment because our kids are in front of screens much more and they're online more. So they want to be safe. On the privacy matter, common sense is, the, I said, the largest homes ads group in the United States, the largest tech ads group in the world. So we wrote the major U.S. privacy law. It's called this. California Consumer Privacy Act, which now applies to everybody in the United States. It passed uh, in 2018, went into effect in this January. So your kid's privacy is protected by a law called COPPA that we helped write and update, and also by the California law, CCPA, which is basically the law of the land on privacy. So, it, but having said that, as a mom or a dad, you have to teach your kids not to do stupid things like give out their phone number online. And by the way, I don't mean stupid because my kids have done that too, but there are basic rules of the road that you can get at commonsense.org to protect your kid. But the bullying issues, we have a ton of resources on that, but ADL.org does too. Yeah. We specialize in this stuff. John. Yeah, I would just, to build on what Jim said, I mean, I think there's a couple things. You know, you can go to, again, ADL.org slash education and get a lot of resources on bullying and cyberbullying to understand what is cyberbullying, how do you address digital behavior? What are the right social media apps and how do you use them appropriately? And how do you help exploit young people? What online behavior is sort of appropriate and safe and res let alone respectful and inclusive? Um, you know, we've got a lot of content that can help educators and parents and families to address the spread of racism and xenophobia and anti-Semitism that's all kind of being catalyzed by this pandemic. And I think, Accurate information is important. Allowing young, exploring people's emotions is important. And right. we're gonna have to learn those behaviors. I mean, when you've got first graders with cell phones, don't be surprised if dumb things happen, you know? That's um, right. But I'm very optimistic that as we get smarter as a society, we'll learn what's kind of appropriate. The iPad shouldn't be a babysitter. The cell no. phone shouldn't be, you know, an au pair. We've got to use technology smartly and wisely. I it couldn't have said it better. Couldn't yeah. have said it better. And you know, this is a teachable moment. As I said, a crisis is a terrible moment to waste. This is a teachable moment because you're home with your kids. This is the time to talk to your kids about being respectful and thoughtful online, to have good values and ethics. And because you're on this much more, right? And all of the common sense guidelines on screen time have gone out the window, basically. <laughs> Do you know, Jim, what are the numbers on, um, what are the numbers on like open wide school? How many users do you have? How many educators, do you have any sense of that? You know, we're just beginning to get the numbers on wide open school, Jonathan, but they're through the roof, right? And the truth is we're just in version 1.0. We're about to launch a version that's gonna have a lot of new live content. A bunch of the major media and, and sports networks are gonna start to partner with us to put content up that is, educational, but more edutainment, I would say. Um, but the truth is, it, we're, we're overwhelmed. But the good news is, we are also putting up stuff around good behavior, bullying, digital citizenship. But also the other issue I want to raise for the folks out there is anxiety and stress. You know, mm. it's okay not to be okay right now. I will tell you, I am a blessed person. I live in a nice place. I have four children and a very smart, thoughtful wife. But these are really stressful times for me. It's really important for everybody out there to know, 
it's weird and stressful for all of us. It's okay to not feel okay all the time. Yep. This is unique in our lifetimes. And it's normal to feel anxiety. People are, there's much higher levels of depression. There's much higher levels of social isolation and loneliness. We have a bunch of resources on the wideopenschool.org site and really on common sense about isolation, loneliness, anxiety, how to deal with that, how to talk to your kids about that. It's weird. I have a really social 15 year old who's not allowed to see his friends right now. That's, yeah. and as it, whether you're a kid or an adult or a parent, it's, it's okay to, this is the new, this is the current situation. You're not alone, we're all in this together. But it's weird and it's okay to feel anxiety. We all feel that right now. I think it's really important for people to know that it's, that it's not just you. We're, we're all experiencing the upset from this. And, and it's okay to acknowledge that and talk about that and talk to your family and friends about that. And if you're really feeling stressed, use crisis text line. Use some of the things where you, if you really need help and advice, make sure you make, get access to the kind of mental health support you need. Because these are, this is a uniquely difficult time. Even though it has some opportunities, this is tough for, for the Greenblatt family, for the Steyer family, for every family out there, this is tough. I, I think that's a great thing to remember. Um, we're at my favorite point of any call where there's a question that I can answer, which is, yes, all of these resources are free. So uh, that was exciting for me. So thank you to whoever it was that asked that. Well done. Well done, Deb. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I, I always look for my question. That was it. <laughs> uh, so the next question, Jim, can you make some recommendations for family movie nights or other activities that might feel engaging and sort of address some of the issues that you just spoke about in terms of finding ways to sort of connect? Commonsense.org. That's what we <laughs> live for, guys. We have over 100 million people on that, on that platform. Go to, we have so many family, we, all you have to do is, I have a kid age five, eight, nine. We will give you more suggestions for family movie night than you can deal with, you know? And by the way, my food family movie night's probably different than Jonathan's family movie night. Depends on how old your kids are. But literally, go to commonsense.org. It is like got a million suggestions based on the age and stage of development of your children or what you care about, whether you like sports or music or whatever you like. So commonsense.org is just, that is what we do for a living on the consumer part of the site. And we will have, you will, be, you will never run out of suggestions uh, on commonsense.org. That I can promise you. Are there any favorites in the Steyer household or the Greenblatt household for that matter? Um, let's see, we love Hoosiers. We love Remember the Titans. We all oh. just watched The Outsiders. Our most recent family movie night was The Outsiders, the uh, S.E. Hinton book. We just all watched that uh, on Sunday night. So we, let me, so we all watched the Michael Jordan special on ESPN mm -hmm. Sunday night because it's made by one of the founding board members of Common Sense, one of my best friends from college. So if you saw The Last Dance, there's gonna be, they moved it up, you know, by three months because there's no live sports right now. I'm a huge sports fan. So it's really hard not being able to watch sports on TV. So we all watched The Last Dance together. And it's really one of my best friends who's the creator producer of that. Um, I will tell you, I'm embarrassed to say that I let my, our kids, they're old enough, we watched Animal House together the other night. <laughs> It's a great movie. I didn't say it's okay for your eight-year-old, but it's really funny. If you have kids over the age of 14, we've watched it for many years. We love, we watched Love Actually as a family. We love Love Actually. We watch that at the holidays every year, but we all watch Love Actually um, over Passover and Easter. Um, you know, I think it's up to what you like. I, that's the great thing is, you know, media is just, there's endlessly good stuff. The common sense basically curates everything based on age, interest, stage, whatever you want. Just go to Common Sense that I guarantee you we can solve that problem for you. Here, here. <laughs> it sounds like it. That's pretty much uh, covering every base. I assume that you also have resources that help kids specifically with stress and mindfulness. That's certainly a popular topic. We do, and that's why I tried to raise the anxiety thing. So we have a colleague, I don't know if you know him, Jonathan, Vivek Murphy, who was the Surgeon General in the- Oh, Obama. yes. He worked, he has, I worked with Vivek. He's a brilliant guy. Yeah. He has a book out about loneliness and isolation, mm -hmm. which is of course a huge issue. I just want to say something. There are a lot of single people out there right now living alone who are sheltering at home. And so they're so, for, remember I'm surrounded by 
my wife and four kids most of the time. They're trying to get rid of me some of the time. But, you know, I'm surrounded by a family, but there are a ton of people out there, a tremendous number of single, single person homes right now in the United States. And so it's normal to feel stress and anxiety. And kids are feeling it too, by the way, because they're not seeing their friends. And these are just weird times. And, and we're in a weird political time too, by the way, right? We're in a very weird, not necessarily, uh, we're in a pretty partisan time, unfortunately, which is yeah. really yeah. unfortunate. You would want the, you would like to see the people leading the country come together rather than dividing us. But the thing is, it's normal, but we have a bunch of resources there of, about how to deal with anxiety and loneliness and social isolation, whether you're an adult, whether you're a kid, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that that's happening now and that that's okay to happen. But the most important thing is that you can talk with other people about it. And I'm a big, I, because I have such a high energy level, I have to meditate once a day or I'll go through the roof. And I exercise every day too, if I don't get exercise. So I think there are a lot of basic things we can do for our own well-being that are really helpful. And, um, and but, but at the end of the day, don't feel bad if you're not feeling okay. Reach out and get the help you need because it's out there. And the ADL provides it. Common Sense provides it. And we're here to, we're here to be there with you and connect you with other people. You here. know, I, I think that's a wonderful point for us to end on. We're really at, almost at time. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us, Jonathan? Or uh, I'm really, or what go? I'll just use this opportunity is to thank Jim for his leadership. I mean, I think, I really think a Common Sense could have just sort of stuck to its knitting in this moment and done family movie night guides. And the fact that you guys have innovated and branched out with wide open schools, I think there are millions and millions of kids who are benefiting from that. There are hundreds of thousands of parents who are benefiting from that. And I just want to share my gratitude publicly to you, Jim. And I would just say this, you know, it's interesting. We've gotten to be really good partners with the ADL over the past year. We have enormous respect for this organization. You know, I'm a good Jewish boy from New York. And I don't think I ever really understood what an extraordinary organization the ADL was. I mean that. And now being able to work on anti-bias and anti-hate together with such a good organization that has such a broad reach around the United States, it makes me really proud to be a friend of Jonathan. And I just say to everybody in the audience, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Use common sense. Use the ADL.org. We're here for you. Hang in there. We will get through this together. Amen. 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 I think that is some excellent advice. And thank you, Jim, for your time today. And Jonathan, thank you and both of you for your insights. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, I hope you will join us again next week for our next week's Fighting Hate from Home webinar, which will be on Thursday, April 30th at 2.30. And we'll feature our new resource, uh, Anti-Semitism Uncovered. And Jonathan Greenblatt will be in conversation with renowned scholar, uh, Jonathan Sarna, and details about registration should be hitting your inbox soon. So we hope to see you again then. Until, I hope you stay healthy and safe and be well. Thank you all. Thank you so much.